Chapter Seven of Cyrus the Great by Jacob Abbott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. The Conquest of Lydia, B.C. 546. There were, in fact, three inducements which combined their influence on the mind of Croesus in leading him to cross the Halys and invade the dominions of the Medes and Persians. First, he was ambitious to extend his own empire. Secondly, he feared that if he did not attack Cyrus, Cyrus would himself cross the Halys and attack him. And thirdly, he felt under some obligation to consider himself the ally of Astyges, and thus bound to espouse his cause, and to aid him in putting down, if possible, the usurpation of Cyrus, and in recovering his throne. He felt under this obligation because Astyges was his brother-in-law, for the latter had married many years before a daughter of Aliatus, who was the father of Croesus. This, as Croesus thought, gave him a just title to interfere between the dethroned king and the rebel who had dethroned him. Under the influence of all these reasons combined, and encouraged by the responses of the oracle, he determined on attempting the invasion. The first measure which he adopted was to form an alliance with the most powerful of the states of Greece, as he had been directed to do by the oracle. After much inquiry and consideration, he concluded that the Lacedaemonian state was the most powerful. Their chief city was Sparta, in the Peloponnesus. They were a warlike, stern, and indomitable race of men, capable of bearing every possible hardship and of enduring every degree of fatigue and toil, and they desired nothing but military glory for their reward. This was a species of wages which it was very easy to pay, much more easy to furnish than coin, even for Croesus, notwithstanding the abundant supplies of gold which he was accustomed to obtain from the sands of the Pactolus. Croesus sent ambassadors to Sparta to inform the people of the plans which he contemplated and to ask their aid. He had been instructed, he said, by the oracle at Delphi to seek the alliance of the most powerful of the states of Greece, and he accordingly made application to them. They were gratified with the compliment implied in selecting them and acceded readily to his proposal besides they were already on very friendly terms with croesus for some years before they had sent to him to procure some gold for a statue which they had occasion to erect offering to give an equivalent for the value of it in such productions as their country afforded croesus supplied them with the gold that they needed but generously refused to receive any return in the meantime croesus went on energetically at sardis making the preparations for his campaign one of his counsellors whose name was sardaris ventured one day strongly to dissuade him from undertaking the expedition you have nothing to gain by it he said if you succeed and everything to lose if you fail consider what sort of people these persians are whom you are going to combat they live in the most rude and simple manner without luxuries without pleasures without wealth if you conquer their country you will find nothing in it worth bringing away on the other hand if they conquer you they will come like a vast band of plunderers into Lydia, where there is everything 
to tempt and reward them i counsel you to leave them alone and to remain on this side the hellas thankful if cyrus will be contented to remain on the other but croesus was not in a mood of mind to be persuaded by such reasoning when all things were ready the army commenced its march and moved eastward through one province of asia minor after another until they reached the hellas this river is a considerable stream which rises in the interior of the country and flows northward into the euxine sea the army encamped on the banks of it and some plan was to be formed for crossing the stream in accomplishing this object croesus was aided by a very celebrated engineer who accompanied his army named thales thales was a native of miletus and is generally called in history thales the milesian he was a very able mathematician and calculator and many accounts remain of the discoveries and performances by which he acquired his renown for example in the course of his travels he at one time visited egypt and while there he contrived a very simple way of measuring the height of the pyramids he set up a pole on the plain in an upright position and then measured the pole and also its shadow he also measured the length of the shadow of the pyramid he then calculated the height of the pyramid by this proportion as the length of shadow of the pole is to that of the pole itself so is the length of the shadow of the pyramid to its height thales was an astronomer as well as a philosopher and engineer he learned more exactly the true length of the year than it had been known before and he also made some calculations of eclipses at least so far as to predict the year in which they would happen one eclipse which he predicted happened to occur on the day of a great battle between two contending armies it was cloudy so that the combatants could not see the sun this circumstance however which concealed the eclipse itself only made the darkness which was caused by it the more intense the armies were much terrified at this sudden cessation of the light of day and supposed it to be a warning from heaven that they should desist from the combat thales the milesian was the author of several of the geometrical theorems and demonstrations now included in the elements of euclid the celebrated fifth proposition of the first book so famous among all the modern nations of europe as the great stumbling block in the way of beginners in the study of geometry was his the discovery of the truth expressed in this proposition and of the complicated demonstration which establishes it was certainly a much greater mathematical performance than the measuring of the altitude of the pyramids by their shadow but to return to croesus thales undertook the work of transporting the army across the river he examined the banks and found at length a spot where the land was low and level for some distance from the stream he caused the army to be brought up to the river at this point and to be encamped there as near to the bank as possible and in as compact a form he then employed a vast number of laborers to cut a new channel for the waters behind the army leading out from the river above and rejoining it again at a little distance below when this channel was finished he turned the river into its new course and then the army passed without difficulty over the former bed of the stream the halus being thus passed croesus moved on in the direction of media but he soon found that he had not far to go to find his enemy cyrus had heard of his plans 
through deserters and spies and he had for some time been advancing to meet him one after the other of the nations through whose dominions he had passed he had subjected to his sway or at least brought under his influence by treaties and alliances and had received from them all reinforcements to swell the numbers of his army one nation only remained the babylonians they were on the side of croesus they were jealous of the growing power of the medes and persians and had made a league with croesus promising to aid him in the war the other nations of the east were in alliance with cyrus and he was slowly moving on at the head of an immense combined force toward the hallas at the very time when croesus was crossing the stream the scouts therefore that preceded the army of croesus on its march soon began to fall back into the camp with intelligence that there was a large armed force coming on to meet them the advancing columns filling all the roads and threatening to overwhelm them the scouts from the army of cyrus carried back similar intelligence to him the two armies accordingly halted and began to prepare for battle the place of their meeting was called pateria it was in the province of cappadocia and toward the eastern part of asia minor the great battle was fought at pateria it was continued all day and remained undecided when the sun went down the combatants separated when it became dark and each withdrew from the field each king found it seems that his antagonist was more formidable than he had imagined and on the morning after the battle they both seemed inclined to remain in their respective encampments without evincing any disposition to renew the contest croesus in fact seems to have considered that he was fortunate in having so far repulsed the formidable invasion which cyrus had been intending for him he considered cyrus's army as repulsed since they had withdrawn from the field and showed no disposition to return to it he had no doubt that cyrus would now go back to media again having found how well prepared croesus had been to receive him for himself he concluded that he ought to be satisfied with the advantage which he had already gained as the result of one campaign and return again to sardis to recruit his army the force of which had been considerably impaired by the battle and so postpone the grand invasion till the next season he accordingly set out on his return he dispatched messengers at the same time to babylon to sparta to egypt and to other countries with which he was in alliance informing these various nations of the great battle of pateria and its results and asking them to send him early in the following spring all the reinforcements that they could command to join him in the grand campaign which he was going to make the next season he continued his march homeward without any interruption sending off from time to time as he was moving through his own dominions such portions of his troops as desired to return to their homes enjoining upon them to come back to him in the spring by this temporary disbanding of a portion of his army he saved the expense of maintaining them through the winter very soon after croesus arrived at sardis the whole country in the neighborhood of the capital was thrown into a state of universal alarm by the news that cyrus was close at hand it seems that cyrus had remained in the vicinity of pateria long enough to allow croesus to return and to give him time to dismiss his troops and establish himself securely in the city he then suddenly resumed his march and came on towards sardis with the utmost possible dispatch 
croesus in fact had no announcement of his approach until he heard of his arrival all was now confusion and alarm both within and without the city croesus hastily collected all the forces that he could command he sent immediately to the neighboring cities summoning all the troops in them to hasten to the capital he enrolled all the inhabitants of the city that were capable of bearing arms by these means he collected in a very short time quite a formidable force which he drew up in battle array on a great plain not far from the city and there waited with much anxiety and solicitude for cyrus to come on the lydian army was superior to that of cyrus in cavalry and as the place where the battle was to be fought was a plain which was the kind of ground most favorable for the operations of that species of force cyrus felt some solicitude in respect to the impression which might be made by it on his army nothing is more terrible than the onset of a squadron of horse when charging an enemy upon the field of battle they come in vast bodies sometimes consisting of many thousands with the speed of the wind the men flourishing their sabres and rending the air with the most unearthly cries those in advance being driven irresistibly on by the weight and impetus of the masses behind the dreadful torrent bears down and overwhelms everything that attempts to resist its way they trample one another and their enemies together promiscuously in the dust the foremost of the column press on with the utmost fury afraid quite as much of the headlong torrent of friends coming on behind them as of the line of fixed and motionless enemies who stand ready to receive them before these enemies stationed to withstand the charge arrange themselves in triple or quadruple rows with the shafts of their spears planted against the ground and the points directed forward and upward to receive the advancing horsemen these spears transfix and kill the foremost horses but those that come on behind leaping and plunging over their fallen companions soon break through the lines and put their enemies to flight in a scene of indescribable havoc and confusion croesus had large bodies of horse while cyrus had no efficient troops to oppose them he had a great number of camels in the rear of his army which had been employed as beasts of burden to transport the baggage and stores of the army on their march cyrus concluded to make the experiment of opposing these camels to the cavalry it is frequently said by the ancient historians that the horse has a natural antipathy to the camel and cannot bear either the smell or the sight of one though this is not found to be the case at the present day however the fact might have been in this respect cyrus determined to arrange the camels in his front as he advanced into battle he accordingly ordered the baggage to be removed and releasing their ordinary drivers from the charge of them he assigned each one to the care of a soldier who was to mount him armed with a spear even if the supposed antipathy of the horse for the camel did not take effect cyrus thought that their large and heavy bodies defended by the spears of their riders would afford the most effectual means of resistance against the shock of the lydian squadrons that he was now able to command the battle commenced and the squadrons of horse came on but as soon as they came near the camels it happened that either from the influence of the antipathy above referred to or from alarm at the novelty of the spectacle 
of such huge and misshapen beasts or else because of the substantial resistance which the camels and the spears of their riders made to the shock of their charge the horses were soon thrown into confusion and put to flight in fact a general panic seized them and they became totally unmanageable some through their riders others seized with a sort of frenzy became entirely independent of control they turned and trampled the foot soldiers of their own army underfoot and threw the whole body into disorder the consequence was that the army of croesus was wholly defeated they fled in confusion and crowded in vast throngs through the gates into the city and fortified themselves there cyrus advanced to the city invested it closely on all sides and commenced a siege but the appearances were not very encouraging the walls were lofty thick and strong and the numbers within the city were amply sufficient to guard them nor was the prospect much more promising of being soon able to reduce the city by famine the wealth of croesus had enabled him to lay up almost inexhaustible stores of food and clothing as well as treasures of silver and gold he hoped therefore to be able to hold out against the besiegers until help should come from some of his allies he had sent messengers to them asking them to come to his rescue without any delay before he was shut up in the city the city of sardis was built in a position naturally strong and one part of the wall passed over rocky precipices which were considered entirely impassable there was a sort of glen or rocky gorge in this quarter outside of the walls down which dead bodies were thrown on one occasion subsequently at a time when the city was besieged and beasts and birds of prey fed upon them there undisturbed so lonely was the place and so desolate in fact the walls that crowned these precipices were considered absolutely inaccessible and were very slightly built and very feebly guarded there was an ancient legend that a long time before when a certain males was king of lydia one of his wives had a son in the form of a lion whom they called leon and an oracle declared that if this leon were carried around the walls of the city it would be rendered impregnable and should never be taken they carried leon therefore around so far as the regular walls extended when they came to this precipice of rocks they returned considering that this part of the city was impregnable without any such ceremony a spur or eminence from the mountain of tumolus which was behind the city projected into it at this point and there was a strong citadel built upon its summit cyrus continued the siege fourteen days and then he determined that he must in some way or other find the means of carrying it by assault and to do this he must find some place to scale the walls he accordingly sent a party of horsemen around to explore every part offering them a large reward if they would find any place where an entrance could be effected the horsemen made the circuit and reported that their search had been in vain at length a certain soldier named hyraeus after studying for some time the precipices on the side which had been deemed inaccessible saw a sentinel who was stationed on the walls above leave his post and come climbing down the rocks for some distance to get his helmet which had accidentally dropped down hyraeus watched him both as he descended and as he returned he reflected on this discovery communicated it to others and the practicability of scaling the rock and the walls at that point was discussed in the end 
the attempt was made and was successful hieraides went up first followed by a few daring spirits who were ambitious of the glory of the exploit they were not at first observed from above the way being thus shown great numbers followed on and so large a force succeeded in thus gaining an entrance that the city was taken in the dreadful confusion and din of the storming of the city croesus himself had a very narrow escape from death he was saved by the miraculous speaking of his deaf and dumb son at least such is the story cyrus had given positive orders to his soldiers both before the great battle on the plain and during the siege that though they might slay whomever else they pleased they must not harm croesus but must take him alive during the time of the storming of the town when the streets were filled with infuriated soldiers those on the one side wild with the excitement of triumph and those on the other maddened with rage and despair a party rushing along overtook croesus and his helpless son whom the unhappy father it seems was making a desperate effort to save the persian soldiers were about to transfix croesus with their spears when the son who had never spoken before called out it is croesus do not kill him the soldiers were arrested by the words and saved the monarch's life they made him prisoner and bore him away to cyrus croesus had sent a long time before to inquire of the delphic oracle by what means the power of speech could be restored to his son the answer was that that was a boon which he had better not ask for the day on which he should hear his son speak for the first time would be the darkest and most unhappy day of his life cyrus had not ordered his soldiers to spare the life of croesus in battle from any sentiment of humanity toward him but because he wished to have his case reserved for his own decision when croesus was brought to him a captive he ordered him to be put in chains and carefully guarded as soon as some degree of order was restored in the city a large funeral pile was erected by his directions in a public square and croesus was brought to the spot fourteen lydian young men the sons probably of the most prominent men in the state were with him the pile was large enough for them all and they were placed upon it they were all laid upon the wood croesus raised himself and looked around surveying with extreme consternation and horror the preparations which were making for lighting the pile his heart sank within him as he thought of the dreadful fate which was before him the spectators stood by in solemn silence awaiting the end croesus broke this awful pause by crying out in a tone of anguish and despair oh salon 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 the officers who had charge of the execution asked him what he meant cyrus too who was himself personally superintending the scene asked for an explanation croesus was for a time too much agitated and distracted to reply there were difficulties in respect to language too which embarrassed the conversation as the two kings could speak to each other only through an interpreter at length croesus gave an account of his interview with salon and of the sentiment which the philosopher had expressed that no one could decide whether a man was truly prosperous and happy till it was determined how his life was to end cyrus was greatly interested in this narrative but in the meantime the interpreting of the conversation had been slow a considerable period had elapsed and the officers had lighted the fire the pile had been made extremely combustible 
and the fire was rapidly making its way through the whole mass cyrus eagerly ordered it to be extinguished the efforts which the soldiers made for this purpose seemed at first likely to be fruitless but they were aided very soon by a sudden shower of rain which coming down from the mountains began just at this time to fall and thus the flames were extinguished and croesus and the captives saved cyrus immediately with a fickleness very common among great monarchs in the treatment of both enemies and favorites began to consider croesus as his friend he ordered him to be unbound brought him near his person and treated him with great consideration and honor croesus remained after this for a long time with cyrus and accompanied him in his subsequent campaigns he was very much incensed at the oracle at delphi for having deceived him by its false responses and predictions and thus led him into the terrible snare into which he had fallen he procured the fetters with which he had been chained when placed upon the pile and sent them to delphi with orders that they should be thrown down upon the threshold of the temple the visible symbol of his captivity and ruin as a reproach to the oracle for having deluded him and caused his destruction in doing this the messengers were to ask the oracle whether imposition like that which had been practised on croesus was the kind of gratitude it evinced to one who had enriched it by such a profusion of offerings and gifts to this the priests of the oracle said in reply that the destruction of the lydian dynasty had long been decreed by the fates in retribution for the guilt of gyges the founder of the line he had murdered his master and usurped the throne without any title to it whatever the judgments of heaven had been denounced upon gyges for this crime to fall on himself or on some of his descendants the pythian apollo at delphi had done all in his power to postpone the falling of the blow until after the death of croesus on account of the munificent benefactions which he had made to the oracle but he had been unable to effect it the decrees of fate were inexorable all that the oracle could do was to postpone as it had done it said for three years the execution of the sentence and to give croesus warning of the evil that was impending this had been done by announcing to him that his crossing the halus would cause the destruction of a mighty empire meaning that of lydia and also by informing him that when he should find a mule upon the throne of media he must expect to lose his own cyrus who was descended on his father's side from the persian stock and on his mother's from that of media was the hybrid sovereign represented by the mule when this answer was reported to croesus it is said that he was satisfied with the explanations and admitted that the oracle was right and that he himself had been unreasonable and wrong however this may be it is certain that among mankind at large since croesus's day there has been a great disposition to overlook whatever of criminality there may have been in the falsehood and imposture of the oracle through admiration of the adroitness and dexterity which its ministers evinced in saving themselves from exposure End of chapter 7